This is Matthew McConaughey. Natalie Portman. James Patterson. Michael Ian Black. And you are listening to Five Questions with Dan Chabell. Corey, welcome to Five Questions. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Let's rock and roll. What was both the hardest and easiest part of being a childhood star? Uh, let's see. The hardest part was waking up at 5 a.m. I mean, nobody wants to get up at 5 a.m., right? Especially when you're a kid and you know that all of your friends don't have to get up for school for like another hour and a half. But you get up and it's pitch black outside. And the first thing they do is take you to the coffee truck. That's rough. Best part about being a child star is you don't got to go to school. <laughs> so you do go to school, but you go to school on the set. It's only three hours a day instead of eight hours a day. So, you know, it's kind of like a much better deal. You get like the shorter amount of time, but you still got to cram in all the work. You just got to cut out all the playtime and the activities and all the stuff that goes in between. But still, to a kid, three hours of school a day sounds a hell of a lot better than eight hours of school a day. For sure. Yeah, I'm a morning person, but I'm a 6.30 a.m. morning person, not five, <laughs> even as an adult. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I'm not a morning person. I'm a 1130, 12 kind of morning person <laughs> versus a 630 a.m. So, yes, five was pretty awful for me, even as a kid when I was used to getting up at 630. And a lot of people know your acting career, but you're also a, a musician. And I just congratulations on your latest single without you, which is number 26 on the Billboard Adult Contemporary chart. Yes, it's uh, the adult contemporary indicator chart. So we're not quite there yet onto the main charts, but it's that close, that close. And 26 with a bullet is definitely the, uh, the strongest we've ever premiered on any chart. So that's really exciting. I mean, usually you get in at like 149 and then you have to work your way up. So to be at 26 already means there's very good potential that we will cross over. So um, fingers crossed. Overall, you're a performer, whether it's music, acting, you can do it all. How has your experiencing experience touring as a musician, both similar and different than your time as an actor? Well, I mean, it is very different. It's very different in so many ways because, you know, it's your show. You're putting on the show. You're deciding what's going to happen live on stage every moment, every night. It's a complete in the moment reality versus something where you're getting direction and where you're being told what to do. When you're on a set, you know, it's like you're being directed with every movement, with every gesture, with every way that you breathe and you phrase, like everything you do, you know, is somebody else's vision. It's their idea. They're trying to get you to understand their vision so that, you know, you can do it like them, which I guess is the case if you're just like a member of somebody else's band. But if you're you know, it's your show and you're directing the show and you're putting it together, then, you know, it's kind of like a lot more creatively free. So it kind of depends what aspect you're talking about. But, you know, again, for my position where I am now, yes, it's, it's much more freeing and liberating as an artist because you create in the moment. Again, one of the differences is, you know, you work from the moment you get there to the moment you leave and you've got to set up, you got to break down, you've got to meet the fans. So there's all this stuff in between, but it still doesn't feel like it's as much work as standing on a set for 12, 15 or 18 hours a day, where much of the time you have to stand in one place and you have to let them light you and you have to wait to do your scene. And, you know, there's a lot of waiting around, but there's also a lot of standing around. And that doesn't really happen with a live show. You come on, you do your sound check, you're on stage for maybe a half an hour, hour to do your setup and your sound check. And then, you know, however long the show is, but you're dancing around, you're moving around, you're not just standing there. Um, so, yes, there's a lot of differences. Yeah, the freedom, the control, you know, just over what you do, I think that's a massive difference, right? It's it's all on you. You know, you're, you know, you can't point to the left or right at the other stars, right? Exactly right. It's on yeah. you. If you don't perform well, you know, it's your fault. There's no one else. Right. And if people don't come to see the show and the money and the show loses money, then that's on your your shoulders as well. You know, so it's it's a lot more pressure, but it's also a lot more reward, I think, if you do it right. 
Absolutely. And you said you'd be interested in sequels to the Goonies and the Lost Boys. Why do you feel you're ready to return to these movie franchises? And why do you think they're still relevant in today's culture? Well, I mean, listen, I've already done two sequels to the Lost Boys. So I've been I've been returning and ready to return and doing so for the last several years. You know, we did the first sequel, I think, in 2008. And then we did the second one in 2009. Um, so, you know, it's been, or maybe it was 2007, the first one, seven and then nine. Yeah. Um, and then we were hoping there would be a third, you know, right on the, right on the tail of those two, but instead, uh, they kind of buried it. And then, you know, now they're making a remake or something. And I'm like, no, no, no. Instead of a remake, they need to make, you know, like a really good final sequel that was kind of like the bigger version that should have been in the theaters all along. That's where I'm hoping they. They do kind of like they did with Ghostbusters when they realized that the remake didn't really do so hot. You know, they went back to the original cast and they made it about them and their story. And I think that's what people want to see from both Lost Boys and a Goonies sequel, if there ever was one. Now, with Goonies, that's one, you know, that was near and dear to our hearts since the day we wrapped. It was like, when's the sequel start? You know, and we all felt that way. Unfortunately, it's such a magical piece of history that you can't just recreate it seamlessly. You know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't really work that way. It's something where you've got to have a really brilliant story that really follows up on these characters, that really takes you to a place that everybody's been waiting to go to, um, especially after 30 years with all the anticipation, or now it's almost, almost 40 years. Uh, so, you know, you can't half-ass it. It's got to be done the right way. So... We're hopeful that one day something happens. I have a feeling something will happen. It may not be a sequel, but it may be some form of continuing the story or franchising it in some way. So I think that there's, you know, good potential. Ralph Macchio of The Karate Kid was also on this podcast and it was very hard. I asked him about returning to, you know, Cobra Kai and, and getting involved again. And he said it took a long, long time for him to do that because he didn't want to ruin the magic and the heritage. Yeah, and I, I understand that. But at the same time, isn't he a lucky duck? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. The guy's uh, suddenly working again and very popular. And, you know, he's got so much going for him. And I think it's terrific. So I'm very happy for him. We're you trying know, to bring the 80s back. Yeah, I used to I used to run into him at the, the conventions, you know, I'll do these conventions a couple times a year. And when I go to a convention, I see all the people who are, you know, great, great stars. Some of them are contemporary. Some of them are from the old days or whatever. But either way, they're all great people. And you're like, I want to see you doing stuff. So for me, it's really great to see him back out there again. And at a high level, in what ways have you used your art to influence positive change in the world? And what lasting impact do you want to make? Well, I believe that I've been doing that since I started songwriting. You know, I mean, um, something that I feel is so important to me as a writer is that every single song that I do has got to have some kind of a message. It's got to be a positive message. It's got to be an important message, something that makes people actually feel and think and, you know, want to dissect it because, you know, anybody can write basic lyrics, you know, like rolling down a six, four, got my back door. Da, da, you know what I mean? Like you can do that stuff all day, but to do something that's really interesting, you know, that, that takes you somewhere that moves you, that gives you an emotional experience. That's a little bit more tricky. And, and I think if you can do it well, music is such a great platform to reach people. And so to reach them with a positive message and one that hits them in the heart and soul, uh, there's nothing better than that. That is a true testament to what we do. And I think when you can actually, you know, move somebody with your art, it's kind of like you've struck gold, you know, because that's the motive for all artists is to actually reach them. Even if it's hate, you know, you can get people to love you, you and get people to hate you, and then you can get everything in between. And I feel like if you get everything in between, you're not doing it right. You know, you're not getting a reaction. But as long as they love or hate you, you know, you're moving them emotionally with your work. And that's the point. Yeah, I think that's the goal of any artist. You're yeah. a painter or you're an actor, a musician, whatever you do. I think the goal is to make that type of connection with the audience. Exactly. 
And so one of the things, you know, I always am so happy about was one of my very first songs I wrote was actually like the second or third song I wrote when I was 15 years old. It's called It's So Simple. And it's about how the world can be a better place if we all just try a little and we give a little, you know, and are a little more selfless and a little more, a little more selfish and a little less selfish. And, you know, it's called It's So Simple because it's as simple as we want to make it. It's up to us to make the change. It's not up to anybody else. So I wrote that when I was 15 and, and the words are still very true today. I still sing it at the end of every concert I ever do because it's just a beautiful piece that really, you know, kind of lives up and, and meets the moment. And it's a reminder. Yes, you it know? is. It's very easy to kind of fall in, into your old habits of, oh, I'm just going to think about myself all the time. And then they hear that reminder, you're like, oh, maybe I should start to think about other people's feelings and, and helping other people's in a positive way. Exactly. We don't have to be selfish. That's the bottom line. We can think about others and have some empathy and some compassion and not be narcissistic all our lives. <laughs> Absolutely. And what's your best piece of career advice? Best piece of career advice is get out. Get out now. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, always believe in your dreams. That's the main thing. Always believe in your dreams and don't self-destruct. Do you know how many people I know that they believe in their dreams, but then they finally get an opportunity and they do everything they can to mess themselves up. I don't know what it is. I don't know why, but I've seen it over and over and over where you give somebody an opportunity, you give them a foot in the door, you give them a chance, and then they come in and they, they act a fool or you know they throw a fit or they say, I can't do this, I can't do that. And they just kind of like refuse to do what you ask of them, which is generally probably some simple task that is their job. So you see it over and over, either it's before they even make it to the job or it's right before they go to the job or it's before, you know, they start work that day, whatever it is. But like I've seen it so many times, people have this innate ability to really royally screw themselves up when they finally get everything they wanted. Do you so think it's masquerading best, as fear? I don't think it's masquerading as fear. I think it's well hidden fear within themselves that they're not even you know aware of. I think it's subliminal a lot of times. So I think that the thing that they need to do is dig deep inside and say, look, if I ever get that opportunity, first, I got to realize my dreams and to realize your dreams, you've got to visualize and manifest it. And so, you know, if you do it right, you visualize it, you see it exactly as you want your life to be. You see the future exactly as you see your future and you want to live your future. And then you pray on it and you manifest it and you make it your reality. And when it does finally come and you finally get that day, I'll give you a little anecdote that will help. So there's two fishermen and they're sitting in their little tiny boat and this big storm swells up. Right. And all of a sudden the boat's rocking and it's going crazy. And next thing you know, they hit a rock and the rock punctures the boat. And now it's got a spout in it that's filling the boat up with water. And they're like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And the guy, the other guy says, well, let's pray on it. And he says, OK, I'm praying, but I haven't heard anything. And he says, well, I heard something. God said he's going to give us a sign. And when he gives us a sign, we'll know that we're going to be saved. And he goes, OK, I guess it's all about faith. And he says, yes, it's all about faith. And then next thing you know, a helicopter flies over and drops down a ladder and says, hey, jump on the ladder. I'll take you. And the guy says, all right, this is it. You were right. We had faith and we got it. And the other guy goes, no, 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 we can't take that ladder. I'm waiting for the message from God still. <laughs> That's so a great example. Is, yeah. The point is take the ladder, take the ladder. Don't wait, do it, grab it, make it happen. It's the dream with the execution. Well, that's great advice. Thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I do appreciate it, Dan, and have yourself a wonderful evening.